Before we start the show, I want to let you know that we will be taking a break next week for the holidays. We will return the following week on January the 2nd with the Washington Post, Elon Mui. Now on to Macro Musings. Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Today is a special episode of Macro Musings where we look at the economics of Christmas. To help us do that, we have two special guests who join us all the way from Germany. Our first guest is Anna Godeka. Anna is a professor of economics and quantitative methods at the ESB Business School in Reutlingen, Germany. Our second guest is Laura Berg. Laura is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for European Governance and Economic Development Research, University of Göttingen. Together, they authored a wonderful article in Economic Inquiry titled Christmas Economics, a Sleigh Ride, that surveys and summarizes the economic literature on Christmas. Anna and Laura joins us today to discuss their article. Anna and Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we're glad to have you on, and we look forward to this conversation on Christmas economics, both the macro and micro side. Now, let's begin by asking, how did you get into economics? Let's start with you, Anna. Oh, uh, that's a tough question to start with. Um, I guess I'm my background is my family. They are all science teachers, and the only thing I knew was I don't want to do uh, science, and I don't want to become a teacher. Um, and my idea was kind of doing something like economics or business, and uh, the way to university here in Germany seems to be different than in the United States. So even as an undergraduate, you do not apply at university. You directly apply to a special study program. So even basically on the last day of high school, you need to decide what you want to do. And I just simply didn't know what to do. Um, and there were just very, very few universities where you could choose as an undergrad business and economics. Mm -hmm. And that's why I actually uh, moved to Bochum, a city in the middle of Germany, um, and to study business and economics as an undergrad. Yet, and then kind of during your time there, you could actually decide whether you would like to become more a business type person or more the economist. And you might guess I found out I didn't really like business too much. Um, and then I found out I didn't like macro too much. So I ended up becoming a microeconomist. Oh, very interesting. Uh, how about you, Laura? What is your story? Well, um, in my family, uh, one part is physicians and the other part uh, are teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow I uh, tend to combine that, uh, although I'm an economist, because I uh, also work in health econo uh, economics and, um, well, I also teach. Uh, but my, my story is similar to Anna's. Um, uh, when I had to decide for field of study, I, I wasn't so sure what exactly to do. And... Uh, I, I like the discussion of uh, current political and current uh, economic events in school. Um, what we uh, surprisingly uh, did most in, in English class and his, um, history class uh, and less on like social science classes. Um, and I, I thought that maybe political science but also economics uh, could be interesting. And um, well, there were limited options to combine uh, those both fields, and uh, then I ended up, uh, well, <laughs> starting to, to study uh, economics and business administration, this uh, combination uh, in Bochum, and uh, social science on the other hand. Uh, and then, similar as for Anna, it turned out that I didn't like business as much, but also uh, I found that economics was more interesting than this uh, social science part. Okay. Now, this article that both of you uh, co-authored and written is really interesting. It's a nice survey. There's a lot of literature in the article that you survey about Christmas economics, so I know it took some uh, serious work to get it done. And I'm wondering, how did you guys get, even get on this topic? How did you come together, and then how did you decide to write this article on Christmas economics? 
Well, actually, it started with a seminar of mine. Um, when starting to teach in, in Göttingen, I uh, first taught a, a master's seminar, and then I had to teach uh, one for bachelor students. And I thought, what would be an interesting topic that, well, all the students can relate to, even those in the second or third semester, uh, something where they don't need much prior knowledge. And actually, I, I asked my brother what would be an appropriate topic. And he said, so when is the seminar? And I said, it's in the winter term. So maybe November or December. And he said, so why don't you do a seminar on Christmas? And then uh, I started uh, to look for the literature. And I found that there's actually uh, lots of literature on Christmas-related topics in economics. So there was some on health economics. There was some on uh, uh, prices. Um, uh, during Christmas time, there was, uh, of course, the literature on uh, the welfare effects of Christmas presents. Mm -hmm. uh, there was enough for uh, 14 topics in the seminar. <laughs> yeah. So we can thank your brother for this nice article, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would kind of say we, uh, Laura and I, we met during our undergrads already. And um, I, we never actually co-authored any other papers. So we knew each other for quite a long time, but we were more friends than actually co-authors. And uh, we used to have a strange hobby, kind of. We teach in a summer school for gifted children during the summertime. And actually, that's how I came into that story. It was kind of the next summer after Laura taught the seminar. And we spent our summer in this summer school teaching a micro class. And she told me about this research. And it was just hilarious. It was warm outside. It was middle of the summer. And we were talking about Christmas. And I guess it was that summer that we decided we should do something with that topic. And then the next summer, we actually then wrote the paper. Oh, very nice story. So let's let's jump into your paper. And uh, let's begin with the macro side of Christmas. And of course, as we talked about before the show started, all macro is really micro if you want to get down to it. But we're going to pretend at least for a few minutes here that uh, we're looking at the macroeconomic side of Christmas. And let's begin with what I think some really fascinating work done by uh, Robert Barsky and Jeffrey Myron, and there's others as well, um, but they kind of started this literature, and that is on the seasonal business cycle. That everyone knows at Christmas time, sales picks up, you know, spending picks up. So tell us about that. Um, what do they find, and, and what are the implications? Well, I, I think most of us know is uh, from well December that uh, the shops are crowded. Uh, the shopping streets or shopping centers are uh, full of people. Uh, we all have this Christmas specific transactions, buying presents, uh, buying stuff for Christmas celebrations, maybe buying a Christmas uh, sweater. And um, well, it's interesting to see that this, well, individual experiences actually uh, becomes apparent in uh, macroeconomic time series. And um, so what this literature does is um, to show that, uh, well, contrary to the uh, standard practice before to abstract from any seasonal variation, that, um, well, to, to show that actually um, uh, that there's a connection between uh, the seasonal uh, cycle and the uh, business cycle, and uh, to show that they may also have the same underlying mechanism. Well, just to have a few stylized facts, it's uh, that literature that uh, shows that uh, actually having a seasonal dummy uh, may explain uh, very much of the variation. Uh, for example, 70% uh, of the variation in GDP growth. Yeah, that's what's striking about this. So the original article from uh, Robert Barsky and Jeffrey Myron was in the Journal of Political Economy in 1989. And they look at the period 1948 to 1985, if I'm correct, I was looking at their, their paper a while back. And it's striking that most of the variation in aggregate economic activity, or GDP, comes from seasonality. That <laughs> Seasonality is this biggest kind of, it's, it's like an exogenous shock that regularly occurs. It comes from outside the system. Every preference has changed into the year, and suddenly you have this, this change in behavior. And it's, yeah, it's interesting. They measured it several different ways, and they got this huge amount of variation being explained by this. Um, 
and it's mostly Christmas. Uh, that's, I guess, the additional thing. It's kind of you have the big seasonality. It's basically Christmas. You have actually a strong growth from the third to the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, in the first quarter, you see much lower numbers. Um, and what I like kind of that you have seen it in many different countries. Um, and it seems that even if those countries don't celebrate Christmas, in other countries, you have another gift giving holiday in the fourth quarter so that you can see the, those effects in several countries over the world. Well, that's interesting. So not so even if they're not necessarily a Christian nation or yeah. Christian heritage, they still have this Christmas or this shopping spree that goes on in the fourth quarter. So yeah. and the thing and is the other thing is go sorry, ahead. The other thing was in, in, in summer actually you can see for northern European countries we tend to go on holidays or on vacation more often than other countries do that we you can also see a seasonality in summer, at least in Europe. Fascinating. And the thing is, it's 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 this fourth quarter spike is huge. I mean, he mentioned, and that they mentioned in the papers that the the, uh, the increase is is significant. I, f I forget it was like five percent or six. It's it's yeah. it's much larger than than typical. And the downturn, actually, the downturn is in in January. So in January, the first quarter, there's a real sharp contraction, and th the boom bust cycle, the last quarter of the year and the first quarter of the year, is often larger than many of the business cycles. Uh, that occurred. Now, of course, the Great Recession is an exception. That was an unusually large one. Um, but if you know, it's understandable, if you go through mo you know, most of the time series, and at least with the U.S. history, that you see these seasonality effects. And I was just tinkering around with the day. I went and looked at some of the data. And unfortunately, um, the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the U.S. quit producing the um, non-seasonally adjusted GDP, but I, I learned in my, my, my search that they will be releasing it again in the future. But you can look at other things. I looked at uh, retail sales, and you see the, the, the seasonal effects are huge. I mean, they're, they're very large. And if you just look at a 10-year you know, period, you can see that the recession is typically the, the, the business cycle. The deep, you know, we take out the seasonality, look at the business cycle part of that, and, and those, those swings often aren't as big as the seasonal s spikes, which, again, it kind of it what's fa really fascinating is, is, is a, a macro guy is is that we just take that out we just assume it away right we we de seasonalize our data we look at it we run our vector auto regressions through our shocks to the to the look at the, you know the business cycle component and we're missing an important part of the story i guess that's we're leaving out useful information um yeah, and i guess that's basically what the research shows that you should look at the seasonality and especially at christmas yeah, and now I, I know there's, <clears throat> we need to be careful. I mean, I guess one difference between, you know, this boom bust cycle that occurs every year and, and a big recession like the Great Recession is, it's it's predictable, it's expected, right? So people, pl I mean, there's there's some level of planning as, a pair, as opposed to a sudden shock like a Great Recession, which people weren't planning on. But even as I dug into this, these articles preparing for the show, um, even though we know it's coming, it's fascinating, they, they mentioned several observations related to this fact that the, the, the you would think, for example, like inventories would build up leading to this, but you, you don't see a proportional rise in inventories that you actually see, a, a, a not only do you see a spike in sales, but you see a spike in production itself. I mean, it's it's truly... But, but is it really that surprising? Um, I mean, wouldn't we expect consumers to purchase the Christmas presents in uh, November, December, we, we wouldn't expect uh, consumers to build up inventories. And maybe with respect to uh, the industry, um, maybe some of the, the Christmas presents um, also follow some trends and some current fashion. So that's maybe there's point. not the time to build up inventories. So that's a good point. So you, you never, you can't produce ahead of time the great, the, the latest hit Christmas gift. So um, that, well, that's a fair point. You would some things maybe, yeah. Some yeah. like I, Christmas I, ornaments I, probably don't change that much. <laughs> yeah. I was just and surprised. There are a lot of people who are actually surprised by Christmas each year. So I might be guilty on that fact. I still don't have any Christmas <laughs> presents at all. Fair so. point. <laughs> yes, yes. Personal So, so it is yeah. an exogenous chuck to you. <laughs> it is, it is. It's fair it's a fair point. Many personal finance people will say, budget for Christmas, budget for Christmas. Many people do not budget for Christmas. Um but it's, I guess what's also fascinating, if you want to take it from the perspective of what explains business cycles, there's different theories, right? There's real business cycle theory. There's 
kind of demand side driven Keynesian or monetarist theories. And and this one here, there's it's truly it's 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 exogenous, but it's it's this pickup and demand that's accommodated by the increase in production. And I guess what's also fascinating about it, so you have this increase in spending, and and you know Barsky and and Myron they they show that prices remain relatively sticky. You don't see as you see more change in quantities than you see in prices, right? So this, so again, kind of a microcosm of, of business cycle debates we're having in the sense that you have this big demand, exogenous demand shock. Um, prices are sticky, so real GDP picks up in that that fourth quarter. Um, it's it's kind of like a little. I, I I think it was like a little laboratory. And the other fascinating thing they point out is that well, several other things. Labor productivity also goes up in in the fourth quarter. Um, so they people you know they keep the same relatively same number of folks, and then there's this this productivity that picks up, and there's some additional hiring as well. But it's, that was fascinating. And finally, they, they mentioned like money. You know, money. There's a seasonality component to money as well um, that that occurs. So there's a, a whole area there, and I know there's been some other work done, but it seems to me kind of an under um, researched area. There seems to be a lot of interesting work. Now, you you do mention in your article some other articles. Uh, you mention when ye went. And he's, he had a, an article you cited, The Business Cycle Effects of Christmas, and this was the more recent one. This is in 2001 in the Journal of Monetary Economics. And you know, he goes and, and he tries to make the connection between um, these seasonal effects and the business cycle. Um, any, anything interesting there you want to speak to? I guess it's kind of a bit more in the first Myron papers, it was more you have a correlation. So it was already in the first papers that they say, say okay, there seems to be at least a correlation between business cycles and seasonal cycles. So those countries who have strong seasonal cycles also have strong business cycles, but that was more thing rather than having a real explanation for it. Um, so they only refer to a correlation and they say there might be the same propagation mechanism for both types of cycles. And the more recent when paper actually tries to actually find some more statistical reasons or better proofs that you actually see that. And it's not too different from the older Myron papers. He actually found that the seasonal shocks explain approximately 50% of the business cycles. Um, so it's actually a strong finding based on better econometrics, basically. Well, that's that's great. And again, once the BEA starts publishing this this data, it would be nice to see some maybe some more research done on that. Um, I found that another short little piece by Yi Wen. He's out now at the St. Louis Federal Reserve, and just I'll just mention this in, in passing. He he looked at you know this idea that there, there's been this great moder there was this great moderation in macroeconomic activity. So from at least in the U.S. From 19, about mid 1980s up until 2007, right before the Great Recession, you see volatility in GDP and these macro measures tend to sta stabilize. We call this a great moderation period. And and he he and again he, he says we're looking just at seasonally adjusted data. What happens if you look at non seasonally adjusted data? What happens to the great moderation then? And it's interesting that you see a similar moderating effect on on the seasonal uh, spikes. They're still there. They're still relative to the, you know, the overall level. They're still important. They still explain a lot, but everything moderates. You know, the trend growth moderates as well as the seasonal part moderates as well. He takes that to mean that there was because people try to come up with an explanation. Why did we get the great moderation? Was it better, you know, monetary policy? Were we just lucky? Was there some kind of structural change through technology, just-in-time inventories? And he he thinks that the, because the seasonal effects are also smaller, there's got to be some kind of structural change that occurred during that period. So a very fascinating uh, uh, discussion there on you know, the seasonal business cycle and, and the link. And, and I think there's a lot we can learn from that and a lot to still be done. Uh, you, you also mentioned in your paper um, about th there's a relationship between the length of the shopping season um, and, and, and the strength of that fourth quarter effect. So can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, I guess that's a very much an American thing. Um, so okay. to be honest, we don't have, so we do celebrate something that's Thanksgiving or a harvest festival. I think you have it in several Christian countries, but by far not to the extent you have in the United States. And in our case, it's, we celebrate in October already. 
Um, and we do not have this idea here of having a dedicated shopping season, which seems to be in the United States between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Mm -hmm. And the, as far as I understand, or my understanding of what I read is that even in the United States, Thanksgiving has not always been celebrated on the fourth Thursday in um, November. So beforehand, it was always the last Thursday in November. Um, but actually, it was Roosevelt who decided that you should have it a bit earlier just to have a longer Christmas shopping season. Um, and then he kind of switched it to the fourth um, Thursday in November, not the last anymore. Um, and um, then you have your Black Friday. I still don't really know why Americans call it Black Friday, <laughs> but you still don't see something like that here in Europe. And then you seem to buy all your Christmas presents in a very, very short time frame. Mm -hmm. And the question for economists is basically... Um, does that have an influence? So whether you have more or less days, do you actually spend a fixed amount of money, um, maybe more tinily over a given longer period, or do you actually increase consumption just because you have more days uh, to spend your money? And the interesting uh, finding, at least for me, was that even each day you have more between Thanksgiving and Christmas actually does increase the sales. Um, so the retail sales increase kind of can consider kind of yeah the effect is quite strong it's um, actually they find that it's about 0.07 percent uh, per day which is not um, yeah it's highly significant and it's actually quite a lot um, there was another study uh, coming up with the figure that for each additional day I think it was 6.5 dollars spent more per day um, more between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is kind of considerable. Yeah, so it's it's fascinating, and it kind of speaks back to this kind of this preference, this exogenous change in behavior, a preference shock. And depending on when the holiday was set, you 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 open up that preference shock earlier, you you trigger it earlier, um, and it, I guess it makes kind of for a nice, almost like a natural experiment, right? You can you can see based on the different days uh, when it when it when it actually falls. Um, so that's that, that was that really neat to read about that. And, you know, along those lines, you mentioned also a p paper by, I guess, it's Casey, it's Mulligan, 2011. And, and he found that, you know, whether we're in a recession or not, you still have these seasonal effects, which, again, speaks to the, maybe the strength of this, this exogenous preference shock or change to, to increase shopping. Um, very interesting. And, and the, even employment. So they don't only fight for um, yeah, more sales. You also see higher employment, even on an aggregate level. So it's not that it's just retail mm -hmm. employees. The number increases. It's actually a large one, and you also can see it in January. Um, so it has a huge effect. Yes. Again, and it actually does seem that people spend more, uh, just to pick up that uh, uh, question meant earlier, whether they, uh, people spend the same fixed amount over a longer time period or if they just spend more. Because this uh, other paper uh, Anna mentioned from uh, uh, Basker uh, shows that people indeed spend more, uh, which might then imply that they spend less in January, which does not seem to be the case, uh, in fact. but. Um, or if they then just reduce the savings. Yeah. So again, I think these are great findings, great great uh, things to know about when we're thinking about broader business cycle discussions. You know, do what happens when there's demand side shocks or supply side shocks to the economy. Now, you also bring out something I have to throw in there, and this is kind of maybe half serious, but you, you, <laughs> the, what, the way I'm going to frame it, it's a serious finding, but my my question is going to be kind of ha joking, but. Uh, you also find, or the literature finds, that there's increased alcohol consumption during the Christmas season, right? So people pick up their drinking, and uh, you know. Now, I, so I'm, I'm just wondering. And I'm, again, this is where I'm getting a little less serious. Do you think there's any link between the, you know, the lubricating the social spirits through alcohol during the Christmas season and the pickup in optimism and spending during the holidays? Well, maybe it's just here, you, sure. Yeah. Sorry, Laura. Go ahead. Oh, go, you go ahead. Okay, so uh, I don't know whether you've ever been in Europe before Christmas, my understanding is, or at least I haven't seen it in the United States to the extent we have it here, but uh, we have all these Christmas markets all around. So each normal city has a little Christmas market with all the stalls where you can 
sell or can actually they try to sell you some Christmas ornaments and some Christmas cookies. But one very, very important part is basically it's cold here. It's dark. You need to get warm. So you drink a lot of mulled wine. You drink this Christmas punch. So um, I don't know if you go to any German city after five or six o'clock before Christmas, you see people being drunk just because of these Christmas markets. And maybe uh, the important bit is all that research, I guess, more or less came from Europe. I think there were some, some, some papers from Australia as well. Um, but they have those findings in Finland to a very large extent that people drink socially much, much more before Christmas. And then, unfortunately, even more people die because of intoxication before and at Christmas, uh, which is maybe not the too optimistic part of Christmas. But, yeah, it seems to be a rather social event and maybe good for Finland or maybe bad for Finland. They have another big celebration in summer. They celebrate Midsummer Day. Um, they even find a lot of more people dying of alcohol consumption on that day, too. So it's basically in summer and in Christmas, you basically die because you get drunk. Well, coming back to this paper on the variation in the length of the shopping season, uh, this actually finds that people tend to spend uh, less money on liquor uh, in January. So maybe it's that well, peak in consumption in December that induces them uh, to reduce alcohol consumption in January again. Or maybe it's just New Year's resolutions, which may also be linked to the increase in yep. consumption around Christmas. So they're sobering up and trying to get their act together after uh, living large. But yeah, so it's, it's it's there's both tragedy and and and, and interesting things. I mean, the tragedy is there's a lot more death from alcohol consumption during this time. Um, but you know, it, it, again, going back to macro theories, does does this drinking bring out the animal spirits? People start because because again, the kind of the point from this the the business seasonal effect on the business cycle. It's it's people there's like this exogenous demand spending shock that occurs, and I you know I, I may be reaching here, but to what extent does the increased alcohol consumption kind of kind of, you know, make that, facilitate that, or maybe it, it, it would happen in any event. Um. It would be nice to have a study whether you actually spend more when you're drunk, uh, <laughs> but I don't know of any, so maybe yeah. that would be something you should look into, do the, or the willingness to, yeah. to buy something higher the more alcohol you you drank before. I don't know. Uh, it, I imagine uh, the reason... Stylized facts come from this. <laughs> we'll have to find some kind of natural experiment to do that, because I imagine the review boards at different places would have a hard time but that would be that'd be a fun one to yeah to see what happens. Um, you also have something in your paper. You review some articles about increased uh, deaths during the Christmas season. Now we mentioned the alcohol related ones, but in general, are there more deaths in that fourth quarter of the year? Uh, it depends a bit on uh, what kind of death uh, you consider. Okay. So, um, and and generally, there's also uh, always the, the common belief that. Uh, the dark times of Christmas, of well, maybe some people being lonely, others having to meet uh, family members too often, uh, leads to more suicides. Um, but in fact, the literature shows that there's not an increase in suicides, but there are in fact less suicides before Christmas. Hmm, so, um, so suicides go down then? Yeah. yeah, but unfortunately they go up at New Year's Day. Um, okay. So less suicide. So maybe you spend too much time with your family, and then um, <laughs> you commit suicide on New Year's Day. But yeah, at Christmas going down in several countries, it seems to be a rather strong huh. fact, but it's increasing in New Year. So it goes down Christmas time, yeah. but right before the New Year. It... Well, actually, it's New Year's Day. New Year's Eve's the low. New Year's Day, it's going up again. Okay. I was wondering if there's any kind of tax benefits or any kind of tax incentives <laughs> going on here. Um, not to be too much. <laughs> yeah, some uh, sick relative decides to do so. Okay, we'll, we'll ignore that question. Um, what about conception during Christmas season? It seems to be, according to your survey, um, an, a spike in the number of, of, of children conceived during this time. Is that right? Yeah, Um well, um, what the literature finds is that uh, there's actually a, a high number of conceptions uh, occurring in December, which then implies that there's a peak in the number of births uh, in September and the following year. Um, and uh, this has been found for, for several uh, countries, so um, maybe it's not that much related to uh, dark times, uh, but rather to, uh, to leisure times. 
because there's, uh, in fact, also a similar effect for, for August vacation. Um, hmm. And there's a, a, another peak in conceptions uh, in August and a, a peak in birth uh, in, in May then. Um, but I, I don't think it's uh, that much about um, planning more children. Uh, it's rather about having more sex because there's also... Uh, an increase uh, in the sales of condoms in December and an increase in the germination of uh, unwanted pregnancies uh, hmm. around December. And and you think it's tied more to there's there's more leisure time around. It's not necessarily related to Christmas per se. It's just people have more leisure, more time on their hands. Uh, yeah, maybe not right before Christmas. So it's uh, probably a stressful time for most of us, but maybe around Christmas and the days. Okay, yeah. After they're they've been drinking for a few days, they they <laughs> been lubricated and they they start uh, conceiving children. Now this is of course maybe a good thing, right? For the for for the Western economies, Europe, the U.S. We need you know our labor supplies to grow. <laughs> we need um, uh, support our our welfare states that are being underfunded in the long run. So we should be happy for this holiday conception shock. We'll call it that. Okay, let's. Let's move on to um, another fascinating area here, and this is where you guys can can shine as microeconomists. Um, well, you've already shined as macro microeconomists, but this is really getting into the microeconomic literature debate, and this is the deadweight loss of Christmas. So there's a huge literature on this, and uh, this I think for many people this will actually come close to home because we've all had this this angst about getting gifts and exchanging gifts on Christmas and not getting what we want or giving the wrong gifts. So tell us about the deadweight loss uh, literature, what it tells us. So maybe you can start. What was your, the worst Christmas gift you ever got? Well, I don't want to get in trouble in case someone's <laughs> listening, but I, I'll generalize here. How about this? We all get the certain, you know, we get a, a shirt from someone that's really ugly looking <laughs> And or we get you know some something we don't really need. We get another tie. I, I'm sure you you probably have a probably better story than I do. So why, why don't you take a swing at that? <laughs> okay, so so maybe just to give you the general idea, as you said, we all know these Christmas presents we got and we just never used. We just throw it away the next day. And uh, it was actually Walt Vogel. It was already in 1993 that he. I don't know, he started to think about Christmas and he said, well, maybe we have a problem here as economists. So um, normally if you buy something, let's say you buy your Christmas sweater or something like that, you just buy it if your willingness to pay is actually higher than the price. So you would not buy anything where your valuation for the good is actually lower than the price. And that's what we as economists or microeconomists call the consumer surplus. So the difference between the price and your willingness to pay. And that's fine if you decide to buy the Christmas sweater yourself. But if your granny gives you the Christmas sweater, the problem might be that the price was actually much higher than what you would be willing to pay for that Christmas sweater. And that's where the problem comes in because you don't generate consumer surplus here, but you actually waste economic resources. And in the first paper from Waldvogel, what he actually did, he asked his students about their Christmas presents and he asked them basically for two things. The first was the willingness to pay. So basically asking them how much would you have been willing to pay for your Christmas presents, which seems to be a lower bound for the valuation. And the other question was uh, asking them what is your willingness to accept? So how much would we now have to pay you so that you give us the Christmas sweater from your grandmother? And um, it was a bit disappointing that he found on average that the valuation for the gifts was actually 30% lower than the price. Hmm. So we would actually say that's really, really bad for welfare. And talking about the gift givers, it seems, for example, that grandparents are really not the best ones. So grandparents, uncles, aunts are not the best gift givers, so they generate the highest welfare loss. Uh, friends and partners seems to be much better in finding appropriate Christmas presents. And the very yeah, pragmatic um, solution of an economist would be just give cash. Because when you give them cash, it's maybe very impolite, but nevertheless, you can just buy what you want to buy. And it seems that um, people understand kind of whether they are good gift givers or bad gift givers, because grandparents seem to give more cash because they kind of understand they don't really know what to give. And therefore, their share of 
uh, cash presence actually much higher than for other gift givers. And as you said, it's a huge bunch of literature. So that was the first paper. And you have several other papers by Walt Vogel actually doing um, similar um, things. And he always found more or less welfare losses. Um, there were other papers who focused more on the willingness to accept. They found welfare gains. So the crucial part seems to be actually to understand what is actually the valuation for the gift you got. Um, and in some studies, you find a welfare loss. and some, you do actually find a welfare gain. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the tension is, and this is, you know, for example, uh, you know, I, I will disclose my mom, you know, likes to say, hey, it, but if I give cash, I didn't put any heart into it. I didn't, you know, doesn't mean as much, doesn't, you know, doesn't, isn't as thoughtful. I didn't go around and shop all day looking for a gift for you. And, um, but the, the, the flip side of that is you get something you don't want and you have this deadweight loss. The world would have been a better place. Now, let me ask this question. There are some gifts, though, you probably don't want to do in cash. So if we all agree that, okay, let's exchange cash, right? There are some things, for example, if I had proposed to my wife and gave her a bunch of cash instead of a ring, I don't know if that would have gone over well. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, or if you want to give a Christmas present to your boss and you just give him cash. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. just weird. There, there are just some, some, some social things, but I must admit in some cases, some presents, I got, um, I don't know whether a very strange gift or cash, what would have been worse. So um, sometimes the question is, what's even worse, giving gift, giving cash, giving a gift, or giving nothing? Yeah. So <clears throat> what advice do you do you give to all our listeners, and how would you summarize the literature? What what would you tell them to do, under what circumstances should they do like cash or gift cards versus actual gifts? Um. Um, there's one paper from Flynn and Adams, which I like quite a lot, that what they found is that um, we are most of us um, are gift givers and gift receivers, although we seem not to be very, very good in actually estimating how important actually the price of the gift is. So their suggestion is just give smaller gifts because we overestimate actually the prices of the gift. So your, your mother will be maybe as happy with a smaller gift or less expensive gift and then with a more expensive gift, and furthermore, you won't create such a big welfare loss. So just focus on smaller ones and just think about how good do you know the person, and it might be your boss and you have to come up with a Christmas present, then just stick to the normal things. So just a bottle of wine or a box of chocolate, just the more mm -hmm. standard ones that might be a good idea. Or our suggestion um, is just come back to wish lists. Um, even if we used to do that just as kids, writing a wish list, what we want to have, it might be a good idea within a family to actually have such a wish list and then don't create a welfare loss. Very interesting. Well, there's another paper that says that uh, gift giving can be optimal if it reduces search costs. And uh, so maybe in some cases, um, gift giving can be optimal if you uh, make some presents where, well, maybe some people don't want to search uh, for themselves or maybe even of some things they don't even know yet. Uh, I mean, uh, if I know that someone likes, uh, likes reading uh, a specific type of novels, and I know a novel, then uh, maybe that person uh, likes uh, being, uh, being introduced to that uh, novel uh, because he or she didn't know it before. And uh, if I think of uh, some of the presents uh, my parents gave me when I was a kid, um, I think it was very much related to reducing the search cost for these uh, specific things, um, not for me, but uh, for like going shopping with me. Mm -hmm. So I think buying socks for me um, is easier than uh, buying socks uh, when I'm around. <laughs> okay. So have you guys incorporated this into your own gift giving, your own Christmas experience? Do you, do you practice what you preach? As I told you, I don't have any Christmas presents yet. So uh, my, nephew, my, my nephews will get some Christmas presents. It's kind uh -huh. of easy. They are kids. They like it. Uh, what, what is more difficult to me for me is actually I try to convince people not to give presents to me. Um, I wasn't always successful with that. But sometimes mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, please don't give me cash. Don't give me any presents. Um, I'm happy just to be around with you, but just forget about them. Yes. I've asked people for wish lists, um, but uh, well, unfortunately, I haven't provided a wish list uh, for myself so far. Yes. Well.
speaking of charitable giving and, and gift giving, let's let's segue into something else that's um, interesting. And what happens to charitable giving during the holiday season? Do you have some articles you cite on that? Um, this also seems to uh, increase uh, before Christmas. Uh, so it seems to be that uh, people are more generous before Christmas. Um, this one paper who uh, analyzed that for uh, church donations and um, well, they, they actually had a, a different focus. Uh, they had to focus on the, the crowding out effect of first mm -hmm. and uh, second donations. Um, but they find that in general, church donations are higher around Christmas when also maybe attendance in church is higher. Um, and uh, also the literature on tipping finds that uh, tipping is, uh, or that higher tips are uh, given before Christmas. Yeah, this you know you've you've heard the uh, of the CE Christians, right? The Christians who only go to church on Christmas and Easter. Um, so, it, and it's, this is true. And I know there's been work done. I've seen some some um, kind of religious studies, social sociology type work looking at seasonal trends in church attendance. <laughs> yeah, I, I was aware of that. But the charitable giving one's also fascinating because, at least in the U.S., there's a tax incentive to give in, in December. Um, if you do charitable giving, you know, by the end of the year, you get to write it off the next year, you, or you deduct it the next year. And uh, I will confess, um, I have been guilty of <laughs> maximizing, you know, if, if, if I have something to give, I'll make sure to give it before the deadline crosses. You know, I make sure to um, make that extra donation at my church or whatever it may be, just because I know there's a tax benefit. So I, I've, I'm, come, I'm having a confession here of sorts, but... Um, I wonder to what extent, if, if, if that's been looked at, do people look at, is are t any of the, is the increase in charitable giving truly from the heart, or is it in part driven by, you know, tax incentives? I'm, I'm not sure. I must admit, I haven't seen a study looking at that. So, um, I don't know, and it seems again to be, a, at least, I haven't heard about this tax incentive here in Europe, so okay. it doesn't matter when you give to, to, throughout the year. So here, you wouldn't have a tax incentive. So I haven't, haven't haven't seen any study, but I must admit I haven't looked um, or tried to find one because I wasn't aware of this tax effect. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I'm not sure. Uh, do you put your uh, donations in church on your tax declaration? Um, yeah, so, yes, mean, absolutely. You do? Yeah, so you, uh, yeah, in the U.S., you can actually, there's the, when you file your taxes, you can actually deduct charitable giving. And as long as you've got some kind of documentation, you know, like my church actually, end of the year, will will tell how many offerings or tithes I've given and stuff, and and then you can go do that. So um, it's, it is it is maybe unique to America. And, and, and the more I think about this as I'm talking out louder, I think there have been some some economists who have looked at this. But, I, but you know, on, on the mar we always respond to incentives on the margin. And, and I, I'd like to believe I, I give because I, I really believe. <laughs> but on the margin, I'm going to maximize my, my, uh, my you know, utility by also responding to tax incentives. Well, let's let's go to something else, and let's look at traveling during the Christmas holidays. Does that change? Uh, yeah, it does. Um, so what you see is airfares go up. It's actually, as a microeconomist, to say good because that's what you would expect. So the yeah. supply is kind of the same. You do not have more airplanes or more slots at the airports. You have higher demand, so prices go up. Um, that's kind of convincing. Um, the other thing we get into is gas prices. At least, um, again, here in plain that before holidays, that doesn't need to be Christmas, but also Easter, gas prices would go up, but there are actually no studies that would confirm that. So we huh. found studies for Canada, the United States, Australia. They could never find actually a significant increase in prices before Christmas and other holidays. So at least there seems no, um, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any indication for that yet. Um, yeah, maybe talking a bit about other prices. Sorry, I'm here, the microeconomist. So what is kind of interesting, or we found kind of interesting, that supermarket prices and consumer good prices actually fell before Christmas, which might be counterintuitive, because, again, yeah. you would say you have a higher demand. Um, why should the prices go down? But on a microeconomic level, you actually you saw or you can see that prices go up. Um, and there have been different explanations for that and uh, one which um, sounds very reasonable to me and you could actually show that with data is that you have something like economics of scale and price search so before the christmas holidays and probably even before things if you do your groceries you have an incentive to go to different 
shops or even to drive a longer distance just because you buy more. So you become more price sensitive and therefore um, supermarkets actually have an incentive to reduce the prices. That is um, one reason which, which um, you could find uh, another reason and um, I'm doing a lot of competition economics here. Um, you, you see that normally or firms kind of tacitly collude throughout the year. And if you have an incentive to deviate from this tacit collusion, it's obviously during periods of high demand and that's before Christmas. And that's another reason why prices might be lower before Christmas. And the last one, which might be interesting, is that um, you see that when you look actually at brand level demand, that people switch from branded products to non-branded products before Christmas or other holidays, basically before because they have a limited amount of money and they are getting more price sensitive. And so they basically buy the cheaper brands or the non-branded products before Christmas. So on average, it seems that the prices seem to fall before Fascinating. Yeah, that is kind of uh, counterintuitive at first, but these are interesting explanations you've given. And, and it reminds me of another point you guys make in your paper or uh, literature you survey. And you mentioned this, and, and many of us probably can speak to this firsthand, personal experience, is that sometimes we have these, these hot toys, these, these popular gifts that sell out during Christmas, right? So why does that happen? Why is the market clearing through quantity, not through price? Why don't things just you know, I and you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when I was a little kid, Cabbage Patch dolls. Um, I remember later Tickle Me Elmos, um, some other hot toys that just sell out really quick at Christmas time. What's the story behind that? Uh, well, you have actually what, what you call hot toys, where you actually have shortages and and things like that. So there have been again been different um, explanations for that, and one seemed to be that even if a product is sold out, so you have these shortages, it's actually free publicity and free good publicity uh. for you. So you have such a hot product and it's actually sold out before Christmas, it might be just uh, better for the period after Christmas that you sell more. Um, and another one that is actually, uh, I think from Kahneman, he mentioned that if you would actually increase the prices, so try to stop this shortage and just don't do the quantity thing but just increase the prices that would actually be very very bad news so the customers would actually be offended knowing okay now um my doll costs much much more before christmas mm. just because it's a hot toy so that would be very very bad publicity so firms try to avoid that so there's some there's some um strategic thinking i mean it could be to avoid the bad press as you just mentioned but that also could be, you know, I'm going to really what they're doing is they're maximizing maybe profits over a longer horizon. If yeah. they create the buzz, yeah, sure, there's a shortage, but you know what? They're going to come back in January and June. They're going to come back throughout the year and buy up the rest of those Tickle Me Elmos when they come back on stock. So as opposed to just a one-time fix, which, as you've mentioned, if you, if you increase the price to clear the market, you might actually lose those sales in the future. Right, that's fascinating. So, um one thing I actually meant to mention earlier, we were talking about in the business cycle, the macro side, and, and that I see here on my list, and, and that is the um, stock market during the holiday season, the Christmas season. Um, there's been this finding in the literature that there's been an abnormal return. So can you talk about that? Yeah, um, this is a relative uh, extensive um, and uh, somewhat old literature already. Um, and uh, this literature finds that um, that uh, stock returns uh, are higher before Christmas, and um, that uh, <laughs> um, like for the U.S., there's uh, something like uh, 20 to 23 times higher uh, the days before Christmas as compared uh, to the other trading days. Um, and uh, this is well, this extensive literature. Um, has also studied uh, this for other countries and finds that um, this is not just limited to the U.S. or it's mm -hmm. uh, rather a common or rather used to be a common uh, thing also for Japan, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, or Hong Kong. And, it's, and it was interesting. It's been persistent, right? It, it normally you think of these anomalies like if there's excess return, then people are going to take advantage, arbitrage it away, they're going to, you know, try to make money off of that, but it's persistent, is that right? It's persistent, but it declines uh, over time. And, oh, um, it has, okay. 
so there's uh, actually one study um, who uh, actually focuses on this um, time trend uh, of this pre-holiday effect, and uh, that literature finds that it's that in, in the US and the UK uh, it's decreasing over time, and uh, that there's actually been a reversal at um, uh, one time period in the US where there were actually lower returns before Christmas. Um, and uh, this paper explains this um, uh, by the fact that uh, market participants um, yeah, based their trading on, on this uh, documentation of this effect, but uh, in fact this effect is already gone. And um, so they, they try to exploit something which is no longer there, and uh, by this they, they create a, no, a new thing and a reversal of this effect then. Yeah, so it's it, it's so the efficient market hypothesis kind of thinking is kicking in here. That at some point the, these opportunities will be arbitraged away, and and they are being arbitraged away. Um, so uh, interesting. Um, <clears throat> so we're running um, near the end of our program here. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, kind of just a, some general questions. You know, stepping back from all this literature and stuff, do we see any evidence um, that you know, as, as some parts of like Western Europe, the U.S. to a lesser extent, are becoming more secular. Um, there's still a lot of religious, you know, activity and religious participation in the United States, and I'm sure in Europe as well. But do do you think, or is there any evidence that would suggest that as you know, as as the advanced economies become more secular, there's going to be less Christmas activity? Honestly, I'm not. Not sure. I haven't seen anything, and um, at least my understanding is um, that the Christmas celebration, at least my, my impression here in Germany, is it is not um, to that extent um, a Christian celebration anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so you might know that in East Germany, um, the number of Christians is quite low. Nevertheless, they celebrate Christmas to a large extent. Okay. Um, so um, I'm not not sure whether that actually. And as you said, you had this nice term for the ones only going to church on Christmas and Easter. Um, so I'm not not sure whether uh, actually yep. the economic background or the economic um, changes, or there will be any economic changes just because the people go to church less often or anything like that. Okay. So it's become more of a more of almost like a, a, a holiday that's that's celebrated, despite you know what people think about religion. So, on balance, do you think Christmas is good for the economy? And both from a short-run perspective and a long-run perspective, what are your thoughts? Oh, that's hard to say. Um, I wouldn't want to conclude here. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, at least as a microeconomist, I would say um, the the picture is mixed. You, you you see some welfare loss. You might not see it to such an extent in other studies. Um, I'm not sure about the macro side, honestly. Um, if you have those seasonal effects and nevertheless those seasonal effects are the same each year, does that really have a long run implication? I'm just not sure. So if you would ask me whether we should still celebrate Christmas or not, I wouldn't want to judge that as an economist. Well, well, one thing we know we talked about earlier, we're definitely increasing the population, right? <laughs> that, that's a positive. <laughs> well, yeah, we, have, we had also more debt. So. That's true, true. Okay, fair point. <laughs> we, need, we need those extra <laughs> babies to pay for the... Uh, <laughs> The cost down the road, so we're we're incurring. It might Christmas. not actually be a real increase, so it could just be a distributional thing. <laughs> yes, intergenerational transfer of wealth. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you guys joining us today on the show. Our guests today have been Laura Berg and Anna Gutica. Laura and Anna, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.